Why do we age? It's a simple question without, of yet, a simple answer. Now, there are many theories of ageing. It's, it's free radicals. It's antagonistic player trophies. It's programs. It's the endocrine. It's, it's immune replying. It's lots of information. It's, it's nutrient, nutrient sensing. sensing. It's P53. It's telomere It's shorting. good old it's wear and accumulation. Well, three things I found myself doing a lot these past few weeks includes thinking about how different scientists are defining ageing, reading very rare and old biology books, and thinking of silly things to write in a YouTube script. In this video, we'll stick with the first two, the latter being a given, of course. Now, with these different theories of ageing, I do have separate videos talking about many of them, but I felt like we needed an update, a nice and recent, not so light reading I've been doing. So in this video, we'll consider what is the current major thoughts regarding why we age, and consider whether ageing is programmed, or if ageing is loss of entropy. So we'll cover a lot. So... And so the story begins when I was on a train on a Friday evening and began to read this book, How Life Began, a speculative study in modern biology written by David Forsyth and published in 1939. Speculative by name, speculative by nature. This is what I wrote after reading it. And I mean, naturally, with a provocative title like this, a lot of the book was spent defining what is meant by life. Which, along with why we age, is another one of those big questions. And also, what is nature versus nurture, or heredity versus environment, is where Forsyth spends most of his discussion. Ultimately, he concludes that we are in an intimate connection with our surroundings. No plant or animal can exist without these external conditions. In the sense, the environment suggests itself as an essential part of every organised being. We cannot escape the conclusion that functionally, as well as spatially and structurally, living beings and their environment merge and blend in such a manner and to such a degree that there is no separating them or isolating them from each other. They constitute a unity. So if we consider the bigger picture, just as what lies around an individual cell is counted as sharing the organism's life, so the fluid that lies around an individual plant or animal should be reckoned a component of its vital process. In this way, the current idea of biological life is expanded. We conceive of it as the joint attribute of both an organism and its environment. Life now becomes a property not only of an organised structure, but also of its outer world. And while I was making notes on this book, I started skim reading this article, The Reality of Aging Feuds from the Arterial Wall, which, without getting too meta, begins. Any discussion about any aspect of aging cannot beg the issue of what aging is. To Edward Lacketer, the author of this perspective article, my view is that aging is a shift in an organism's reality. So, what's reality? This is another tough question. My view is that reality can be comprehensively defined as a system of mutual enslavement of DNA and its environment. If this appears to be a naive assessment of reality, check out what constitutes the DNA environment. He explains a bit in this video here. And as we get older, uh, all of those interactions, that DNA environment system starts to fail in those interactions among all of those layers of environment and our DNA uh, becomes different and uh, we can now measure that. It's sort of a, a um, global way of assessing who we are and what's happening to us as we age. So ultimately his view seems to be that aging can be construed as a series of failures of the signaling within the DNA environmental system. And because it's a fun sentence to say, I will repeat it. Reality is a system of mutually enslaved DNA and its environment. Now this is beginning to appear quite similar to the ideas that David Forsyth was presenting in his speculative book. And you have to remember that in 1939, they, they knew DNA existed, but the link of DNA being the hereditary material was not fully understood. And hence it's sort of missing from David's discussion. But they both had this deeper appreciation of the interaction of both the sort of living organism and its external environment. Anyhow, the answer given is that the robustness and flexibility of the DNA environmental system is lost with age. But that still leaves us with the question, but why? 
Now, I was actually going to make a video on these two texts alone, but then I came across a recent review article, Aging as a Software Design Floor, and went, aha, this sounds interesting given what I've just been reading. Wouldn't it be fun to add it to? And in this article, the author proposes that we age not because of inevitable damage to the hardware, but because of intrinsic design flaws in the software, defined as the DNA code that orchestrates how a single cell develops into an adult organism. Now, at first glance, these two definitions, one as a shift in an organism's reality, and one due to intrinsic design flaws, may appear disparate. But as we'll see, they are more aligned than you may think. So let's dig deeper and discuss the arguments put forward in this recent review. The first thing we should probably clear up is what is meant by hardware and what is meant by software. Hardware here encompasses all elements of biological systems, so not just DNA, but all the organs, tissues, the cells and the structures, so the mitochondria, telomeres, proteins and so on, most of which have at some point been hypothesised to be important in ageing. On the contrary, software is the genetic program, the DNA code that orchestrates how a single cell becomes an adult human being capable of reproducing, ultimately, our evolutionary purpose. Herein, I, he, presents and explores the hypothesis that perhaps ageing is not a result of inevitable wear and tear or accumulated molecular damage in the hardware, but rather that ageing is caused by design flaws in the software itself. Simply put, I hypothesise that a mouse develops and ages 20 to 30 times faster than a human being because its developmental software program runs 20 to 30 times faster than in a human being. So what evidence is there to support this hypothesis? Well, let's first briefly introduce the alternative hypothesis that ageing is not programmed, the idea that ageing is due to stochastic damage and errors. So this includes theories such as the wear and tear theory, the free radical theory, and the accumulation of somatic DNA mutations. That's it, brief introduction over. Now this review doesn't argue that events like these don't happen and aren't important. In, in particular, there is an entire section considering how cancer is an exception to this idea. But instead, that these features, like DNA mutations that aren't repaired, are due to failures in the software, suggesting that aging is not not programmed. So evidence number one to support the theory that aging is programmed. Take a good look at this beard. <laughs> and then take a look at these two images. One shows the reflection of the right side of the beard, one the left side. They look about the same. If aging was due to random accumulation of damage, then why is hair greying symmetrical? That is what the authors of this paper conclude. The results presented with aging of the hair follicles of the male beard indicate a symmetrical pattern of the greying parts on the left and right sides. These findings suggest that greying areas are not formed as random distribution. Now this is probably a weak line of evidence, albeit rather entertaining, but more compelling evidence comes from considering DNA methylation, a modification, or tag you may like to think of it, that can be added to cytosine residues of DNA. If one tracks whether a certain subset of these cytosine C residues have methylation or not, and creates a sort of score for it, many researchers have observed that it correlates with chronological age. Irrespective of whether these methylation changes are causal to aging or just correlative, the surprising accuracy throughout lifespan doesn't fit the idea that aging is a product of entropy breaking down the body. To quote Rajan Horvath, while the speed of aging can and is affected by external factors, the essence of the aging process itself is an integral part of and the consequence of the development of life. This is what the review argues. And these DNA methylation changes, otherwise referred to as DNA methylation clocks or epigenetic clocks, have been employed in other studies to investigate the biology of aging. Most recently, I discussed the information theory of aging, the theory that Aging in eukaryotes is due to the loss of transcriptional networks and epigenetic information over time, driven by a conserved mechanism that evolved to co-regulate responses to cellular damage, such as a double strand break or a crush injury. One of the key parts of this theory is that epigenetic marks, unlike DNA mutations, are actually reversible. 
But as I discussed earlier this year in this video, the data for testing the information theory of aging is pretty sparse at the moment. And that could be because the information theory seems to be part of the software and captures only some aspects of the aging process. Anyway, speaking of this software, we haven't fully addressed what is meant by a design flaw. Now, I think we can all grasp the concept of a design flaw, but what does it mean when it comes to aging? Well, the argument put forward in this review is that the developmental software program is comprised of a set of instructions that trigger the complex cascade of events that enable us to develop from a single cell. The software is optimised for reproduction and hence it may fail to deactivate programmes later in life that become detrimental. The provocative support for this comes from considering the relationship between sexual maturity and lifespan across mammalian species. This strong positive correlation suggests that the pace of ageing is mechanistically linked to the pace of development. And in fact, there's even more recent studies to support this idea that slowing down developments could increase lifespan. For example, Fadim's Gladyshev lab showed using genetically diverse mice that when the mice were given rapamycin for the first 45 days, a compound that is thought to inhibit cell growth, the median lifespan was extended by 10%. So by slowing down this early developmental stage, it increased the lifespan. So given this information, it does seem that maybe the instructions in the developmental software later in life lead to damage to the hardware. But to really be able to test and see if this hypothesis is true, we need to define the changes in information usage in cells that with age result in this damage and a decline in function. So basically, what are the examples of this design failure? Well, this made me think of a recent paper I came across on the dream complex. The dream complex is involved in repressing a subset of genes that are involved in DNA repair mechanisms. And essentially, this study suggests that this dream complex represses these DNA repair mechanisms in somatic cells, but not in germ cells. Again, it's sort of in line with this idea we've been throwing around. And it suggests that reactivating repressed DNA repair mechanisms could be a way to prevent aging in cells. Moreover, another random thought I had that's worth considering is that some proteins are produced at lesser amounts after development, one being the protein elastin that is purported to no longer be expressed correctly after adulthood. Elastin is an important component in the skin and arteries, in particular for, well, elasticity, unsurprisingly. The protein is purported to have a half-life of 70 years, a long time, but not a lifetime, and hence could be a reflection of what would be defined as a software design flaw, this repression of elastin expression. So to summarise this little section, one major implication of the hypothesis proposed here is that cells know how to avoid molecular damage and ageing, but because of the design flaws in the developmental software, they just stop doing so later in life. Which leads us on to phase three, the solution. What can be done about this? How can we modify the software to reactivate some of these repressed programs? Well, one thing is to reboot the system. And one mechanism for this that seems to be possible is so-called epigenetic reprogramming. Reprogramming an aged cell entails restarting the software, which involves resetting the epigenome. And we know that this could be possible, one from the fact that each new zygote starts fresh and you know newborn babies aren't already pre-aged to the age of their parents. And secondly, that studies have employed this cellular reprogramming approach using the infamous Yamanaka factors to partially rejuvenate tissues in old mice. But it's important to state here that even if we find ways to reboot the system using epigenetic reprogramming, it doesn't guarantee that all aspects of aging can be reversed. In this review, presbyopia is mentioned. This results from overgrowth of eye lenses distorting vision. And the author suggests that resetting the developmental program may not necessarily refer to the outgrowth. It's like how baking a cake, at least at the moment, there's no way that you can go back and, you know, regain your initial ingredients. And so it basically suggests that research at the moment should be trying to understand what aspects are reversible and whether or not it's a matter of retracing the steps 
or whether or not we instead go full circle and find an alternative route back. And so where do we go from here? Well, restarting or rewinding the developmental software program to rejuvenate cells and achieve clinical benefits in aged tissues holds great promise, but will likely require considerable fine tuning, as well as tailoring to specific tissues and degenerative processes. To crack aging, we ultimately need to understand how information encoded in the DNA sequence and memorized in the epigenome instructs a single cell to turn into an embryo, then a fetus that is later triggered by genetic information to become a newborn. It grows to a child and adult, and then a subset of that information causes it to degenerate, age, and die. The hopeful end is that, importantly, if we age because of the software's run-on rather than passive damage to the hardware, the most cellular ageing changes are reversible. Information is suppressed, not lost during ageing. So with that, we've made it to the end of this jam-packed video. If you enjoyed it, then you might like this video here, whatever it may be. Otherwise, thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.